Hey guys and welcome back to the Cincy Junior Sabbath School Show. My name is Kunedu and today we are on Lesson 13 for both PowerPoint and Cornerstone Lessons. Before we get started, you can find the books at www.powerpointconnections.net and the Cornerstone book at uh, cornerstoneconnections.org. I hope you guys can go check that out. Um, to start off, we're going to start with the PowerPoint lesson and the title is Gift Exchange. Paratext is found from Jeremiah 29 verses 11 to 13 and it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. The PowerPoint says that we accept God's gift of salvation as we seek to spend time with Jesus daily. Amen. The Cornerstone Lessons title is Calling Change Agents. The key text is found from Acts 1 verses 10 to 11. And it says, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus will come back in the same way you have seen him going to heaven. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us, and I hope you guys can stay tuned for both PowerPoint and Cornerstone discussions. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Cincy Junior Sabbath School live show. My name is Happy. My name is Winifred. My name is Wilhelmina. And then we also have uh, Joanna also participating as one of the guests. And also um, our special guest already introduced herself. Can you please introduce yourself again and then also what you do? Okay, so my name is Wilhelmina. I am an MD-PhD student um, or a candidate. And um, I'm currently based in the Cleveland area. Um, I'm the outgoing health director for the Cleveland Diane SD Church and the incoming uh, youth director. So yeah. Thank you for joining us here on our show. So, uh, Thank you guys for having me. Mm -hmm. So uh, before we continue on our show, I'm gonna lead us into an opening prayer. So may we bow our heads and close our eyes. My Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for bringing us all here today to learn about you. I pray that this day goes successfully and also our viewers can tune in and listen until the end. We remind you, I pray, amen. So uh, we do have people that do stream our show. So coming from Hope Channel, they replay our videos on their satellites and also it's repeated on Hope TV. Sundays at 12 p.m., Tuesdays at 3 p.m. It's also repeated on Obra TV and also repeated on CB Radio Ghana's new page, both Facebook and YouTube every Monday, 7 o'clock p.m. EST. We also uh, stream our own channel on YouTube Live. So we are on lesson 13. We're gonna start with the PowerPoint. The title for the PowerPoint is Gift Exchange. And the paratext is found from Jeremiah 29, verse 11 to 13. So Joanna will give us a summary of the PowerPoint lesson. So this PowerPoint lesson was about like a teacher and he had his class and he was talking to the students about like the things about Jesus and how they were similar to that Jesus' birth and how he died as well. Thank you, Joanna, for your summary. So now we're going to head into the discussion, having our special guests and also Winifred join us. So the first question for the PowerPoint discussion is, 
There are many examples listed in the story as to how Jesus' birth was linked to his death. Can you name a few? Uh, one was about how when Jesus was born, he had the first supper, and then before he died, he had the last supper, and it was all related because in both of those suppers, there was the sharing of the birth. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, which which was an interesting discovery for me, um, it was about how when God was, you know, breaking the bread for them and then having that um, with Bethlehem, which means bread, when you translate it, God later says that he is the bread of life. So that was an interesting discovery for me. And then our special guest, um, there were many examples listed in the story as to how Jesus' birth was linked to his death. So can you name one? Yeah, so there were many examples, and this kind of ties into the idea that Jesus um, came and he was born for a purpose. Sometimes, especially around Christmas time, we celebrate that Jesus Christ came, but we don't really um, bring it all the way to why he came. And so um, the fact that when we look at the Bible, we see so many similarities between his birth and his death shows us that there was a plan from the beginning. It wasn't by accident. It wasn't a mistake. There was a plan from the beginning. And so one of the examples that shows um, that we see in his uh in his birth and towards his death is that he was both cast outside. So in Luke 2, 7, it says that Mary gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And then we have Hebrews 13, verse 12, where it says, the high priest carried the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. So in both cases, Jesus is outside, so he's cast out. So the person that came to save us is someone who was cast out from birth all the way to his death. And then another example that the lesson alludes to is that um, at both, there was myrrh present um, for use upon him. So when mm -hmm. Jesus was a child, the wise men came and they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then later, um, when he was being buried, they also used myrrh to anoint him. And so myrrh was used to anoint um, the kings and as well as the prophets in the olden times. And that shows that Jesus was set apart as well as um, holy from all others that came before him. Um, and then the last one I would say is that there was darkness. So Jesus was born at nighttime, there was no room for him. And that, and when he also died on the cross, there was a great darkness that came. And so we see a lot of similarities for when he was born and also when he died. Thank you so much for your explanation. So the second question for the PowerPoint discussion is, what does it mean to you guys to seek God with all your heart? I like to seek God with all your heart. It's like telling you, like, when you're trying to find him, you have to like, do everything, like, be fully willing to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for me, it's similar to um, finding someone that you can confront in. Um, just that this one, you can't see the person, obviously. But having that um, person that you know when you go to them and pray to them, your your prayers may or may not be answered, but knowing that they have the good intention of whatever that happens to you, there's a purpose for it. And whatever it is, it's something that is going to be befitting to you. That's just a comforting thought that I have when it when it's like, okay, I need to like just let go and just let God do what God is going to do. Mm -hmm. And then Wilhelmina, uh, what does it mean to you to see God with all your heart? So when I was looking at this question, um, I looked at the both the Old and the New Testament words for seeking God with all your heart. And so what we see in the Bible is we see that the word to seek God, it means to seek the face of him. It also means to desire him. It means to examine or explore. It means to seek earnestly, to diligently search for, to wish for, also mm -hmm. to crave, to investigate, to pursue. Um, and so these are all the kind of ways to say the same thing, seeking God. It means wishing for him, craving for him, pursuing him. And how can we do that? We can't do that on our own. Jeremiah 24, seven says that I will give them a heart to know me. Um, and Philippians 2, 13 says, for it is God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. So this is this seeking him is not something that we can even do ourselves, but it's something that God um, enables for us to do. And when we want to seek God and when we want to seek him with all our heart, 
things that can come to mind that can help us kind of figure out how we can do this is when we make God our first love, meaning we love him more than anything else. You know, oftentimes people talk about, oh, when they have kids, like, wow, they look at the child's face and oh my goodness, <laughs> I was in love. And we all know like our parents, like our moms would do whatever for us. Like I know my mom would move heaven and earth for us. I know my dad would do anything for me, right? But mm-hmm. God loves us like that. And he wants us to put us even before our parents, like put us even before an offspring that we might have in the future, right? So we're supposed to love God that much, right? And then also we need to make God our treasure. So that means we value him more than anything else, meaning that it's more important for us to give offering or it's more important for us to spend time with God than it is for us to hang out with our friends or do other things. And the last thing is making God our passion. So when you're passionate about something, you want to spend so much time with it. You want to learn as much as you can about it. You, it literally takes up your whole life, right? Being passionate about something, you know? Mm-hmm. And so even when we look, for example, if we're passionate about some someone um, on Instagram or on our phone, like we're constantly looking at them, you know, when I'm like really wanting to learn something, like I'm on my phone and I'm scrolling, okay, you know, what is this person saying about it? What is that person saying about it? But that same kind of passion is what God is calling us to have for him, to be so consumed with him that we put him first as our first love we treasure him and we make him a passion in our life um, and then we'll be able to seek god with our whole heart thank you so much thank you so much for your discussion i mean your answer so uh for the next question is what does the power text which is jeremiah 29 chapter 11 to 13 mean to you Joanna, when you're ready. Did you hear my uh, question? Oh, could you please repeat that? Want me to repeat it? Yeah. Uh, what does the power text, which is Jeremiah 29, chapter, I mean, chapter 11, Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 to 13 mean to you? So you he like meeting with you throughout the time and like he'll guide you through whatever's in that and what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I think the first couple of lines just gives me a comment that says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Right, we're always talking about God is love, and that's just I don't that test is just like wow. I don't know if, like, um, sis was saying, like, we need to love Lord more than our parents, right? I don't even know how much love, right, you can give to somebody that is like somebody's planet, the plans that they have for you, you don't even know them, you've never seen them before, and it's like. I have these plans for you to prosper, not to harm you. It's just, and we're sinners who have like, the, every single day, we pray mm-hmm. to God and say, oh God, I'm so sorry for this. And then the next day we're like back to the same way that we used to be. But God has told us that no matter what, he's not gonna let us go. Like he has plans for us to prosper, not to harm us, even though we go through these things that we go through, going back mm-hmm. and forth. We do the same thing with um, our parents, right? Our mm-hmm. parents love us unconditionally, but no matter what, we're still the kids, you know. Yeah. They always say, um, when you go when you go somewhere, like you leave the house, there's always home. There's always a place to come back to, and mm-hmm. that's what God's love is for us. And then our special guest, what do you think um, your answer is to the question? Yeah, I really love kind of what Winifred shared, um, and I can tell how deeply like this verse resonates with you. And for myself as well, I cannot tell you guys how many times like I have stumbled across this verse and literally I like broke down. Like I just started crying. <laughs> I mean, everything in the Bible is there for a reason. Like there's the reason that God tells us like, okay, you know, I know the plans I have for you. Or even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it's because there will be times when you'll be walking through the valley of the shadow of death and you're going to wonder what's going on, Lord. And like, this verse is for you at this moment. And I feel like this verse has been for me at so many moments. Like, you know, sometimes you're like, what is going on? Like what's going on with 
with school, what's going on with my parents, what's going on with my friends. Like, I don't understand it. But like, when you read this, God is saying like, relax, I got this. <laughs> I get from this. Like, it's literally like God placing his hands on my shoulders and just like, like telling me to calm down, you know? And so I think it's such a beautiful, powerful verse. And to me, it just gives me, it gives me a calmness with knowing that like, whatever I'm going through, God already saw it. He knew it was going to happen and he has accounted for it in his plan for my life. So even when I'm at my lowest of low, God is like, that's nothing because I know where you're going. This is all part of the plan. Like you will overcome this. And he says mm -hmm. that you will have a hope and a future. Right. And, you know, when we pray to him, he will listen. You know, that is like if, one, if, if our parents told us, like, whatever you ask for, I got you. That's essentially what God is saying here. Like, whatever you ask for, like, whenever you come to me and call on me, I got you. I'm hearing you. Like, you're not, like, preaching to, like, an empty room. You're not screaming to an empty room. When you're crying, I see that. I hear it. Like, I will listen to you. And so I think that's such a calming, it, it gives me so much peace and happiness and joy knowing mm -hmm. that God loves us that much. And he already knew whatever we were going through, whatever we were going to face. And he already um, has prepared an answer for us that he will be with us. He will help us overcome. He will prosper us. So mm -hmm. um, that's kind of what the verse means. Thank you guys for your answers. And the last question for the PowerPoint discussion is, God has given us the greatest gift of all, which is his son, Jesus. What can we give in exchange for this gift he has given us? I feel like we could like read the like the gospel, like share what we know about him because of what he did for us and how he died for our sins, so that we could like go with him to heaven when he comes. So I feel like we could share the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, for me, uh, if I'm to say specifically what exactly you can give in return for God's love, there's probably there's not a, a, a number, there's not yeah. a specific thing, right? But there's there's always that um, reminder that we've been brought onto this earth to serve, right? And mm -hmm. to give out and just be a, a light in the world for other people to see what God is capable of doing. So mm -hmm. I think like she was saying, just being the light in the world and just continuously just preaching the gospel and just showing that God has brought me from this to here, you know? That yeah. Was, that would be a little gift that I'll give to God. <laughs> and then our special guest. Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. It actually reminds me of something similar that the adults were studying in their Sabbath school. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about how, you know, when God said, give back tithe, he didn't say, you know, if we believe that everything belongs to God, technically he could say, give me 90 and keep 10. That would still be God being very gracious to us, right? Like, yeah. keep 10, I want you to give me 90, right? You know, God could definitely say that because all belongs to him. And I think similar to what Winifred was saying, like, you know, what can we really give God? And I think in this instance, the answer is everything. And the reason why the answer is everything is because that's what God gave us. Like, when he gave his son, he couldn't give, there was nothing higher. There was nothing more that he could give. Like, he did not give the angel Gabriel. No, he gave his son, which was part of him. Jesus was there in the foundation of the world, you know? Like, he was there when they were creating each day, when they created Sabbath. So he couldn't give anything greater than Jesus, right? And so when we ask ourselves, what do we want to give God in return? It's, it's what shouldn't we give God? Like, what are we going to hold back from God? What are we going to hold so close to us that we won't let God near? And I want us to make this practical because I feel like so many times, like we sit down and we say this, but we don't really know how to apply it, right? So if mm -hmm. we're saying that like, there's nothing that I want to hold back from God, that means that, you know, I'm going to trust God with my education. I'm going to trust God with my test. I'm going to trust God with which high school I go to. I'm going to trust God with which college I go to. I'm going to trust God with who my uh, boyfriend is, or if your parents aren't allowing me to have boyfriends, which is good, um, who my husband will be, right? So, you know, we're going to really trust God for this or you know I really want this present for Christmas I want this new phone you know I'm going to trust God that 
whatever my parents are able to give me for Christmas or whatever, like it is what is good for me at that time. Like we need to make this practical. Like when we go home and we're facing challenges and, you know, maybe our parents are like, okay, I want us to do family worship, but you don't want to do family worship. There's so many other things that you want to do at this time. I think mm-hmm. that's the time to remember Jesus Christ gave it all for me. You know, can I give my family 30 minutes of my time so that we can go through the lesson? We can go through a Bible reading. Do I, can I give that back to God? And, you know, when you are at that moment, remember the 90 versus the 10. Like, God could have asked for 90, you know? So I just want to thank God that he just wants 10. Um, <laughs> like, if we apply that, we'll be very grateful to God, you know? So, mm-hmm. yeah. Thank you so much for your explanation. And also thank you to Winifred and Joanna for you guys' um, answers to the discussion. So before we continue to the cornerstone, we're going to have an intermission of some special music. much to the first Ghana uh, Children's Youth Choir for coming onto our show to uh, listen to your song. So um, don't forget to share this video on YouTube, Facebook, anywhere you can, even also, also to your family members. So now we're going to head on to the Cornerstone. We're also on Lesson 13 for the Cornerstone, and the title is Calling Change Agents. And the key text is found from Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. So Winifred will give us a summary on the Cornerstone lesson. Um, yeah, so our lesson today is um, starting with the disciples heading out to a mountain in Galilee. 
and where basically they saw Jesus and Jesus was telling them that I am going back to where I came from, but I'm always going to be here with you, but you guys should share the gospel and, you know, share my message to other people. But when um, Jesus was going back, they were looking up in the sky and two angels or two people in white, I would say, mm -hmm. came down and were asking them, why are you guys staring up in the sky? And that's where the story basically ends. Thank you so much for your summary for the Cornerstone. So now we're going to have our special guest and also Joanna join us in the discussion. So the first question for the Cornerstone discussion is, why do you think two men dressed in white questioned the disciples as to why they were still staring up into the sky? Um, okay, so I guess we should all put ourselves in their position, right? In the disciples' position. Um, you've just seen Jesus die, right? And obviously mm -hmm. came back to life. And then now he's telling you to go ahead, share the gospel. Go ahead. I'm just going to go back to where I came from, you know? And, you know, I, I think for me, thinking of where their mindset was, I would just be like, God, uh, you need to come back here <laughs> and mm -hmm. help me out here. It's not like you're going to go back up there and like leave me here by myself. You know, I think it was just, why are you guys not believing that, you know, you're going to be okay. Like, mm -hmm. God got you, you know, like how yeah. we were talking about the, um, in the last um, lesson for um, PowerPoint. Um, just trusting that God has a plan for you and he knows what he's doing. Like, it's all in the plan. But I think for that moment, they were just confused and the um, the two men in white were just like, why are you still here? Like, get mm -hmm. going, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> share the message. But I think for me, if I was in their position, I think that's what was going on through their head. Thank you. And then Joanna. I agree with what Winfrey said. I feel like the disciples were just confused and like wondering why the people like really just go like that. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I feel like the people in white were just like, like they're like just like what the point of the PowerPoint said. Like I really agree with you, but they just like they need to start get going and sharing the gospel. Mm -hmm. And then uh, our special guest. Why do you think two men dressed in white questioned the disciples as to why they were staring up into the sky? Yeah, so when I think about this question, um, it kind of reminds me of like youth camp back in the day when I was still a youth. Um, and I remember like the night before youth camp was about to end, I would get like so sad. Like, I can't believe I'm going back home. Like, I was having a good time. Like, I was enjoying the message people the food everything like I would just feel so sad it's like I couldn't even really enjoy like the last day because I was like oh my goodness this is about to end you know and so I feel like the disciples at this time like they they're looking up into the sky because it's like I just gave three years of my life to this guy like you know I thought you know he was gonna come and you know set up a kingdom here on earth like I told my wife, like, hey, I don't got time. You got to focus on Jesus. Like, I told my family members, forget you. Like, you put everything aside. And now it's like, he's gone. Like, he's not there. And, you know, I think that the reason why the two men dressed in white questioned the disciples is because I think they kind of needed to, like, like, snap their fingers and help them remember that, Jesus prepared them for this moment. Like Jesus knew that he was going to leave and he prepared them for this moment. You know, I think mm -hmm. the two men dressed in white were helping them realize that like they actually still had work to do that even though Jesus was gone and even though it was sad, Jesus made promises to them, right? Jesus mm -hmm. told them certain things before he left. And I think they were trying to help them remember that. Remember that even though it's sad that Jesus is leaving, you know, they were witnesses to the Jesus' life of sacrifice. They saw his labors for Israel. They saw that whoever came confessing their sins, he freely received them. You know, mm -hmm. he gave a message of mercy for the whole world, for Jews, Gentiles, for all, all of us, right? And so the two men, Bess and White, were trying to, you know, kind of cue the disciples into realizing that even though Jesus left, he made the promise of the Holy Spirit for them. Mm -hmm. He made the promise that, you know, you have work to do, right? And I'm going to come again. Right. So I think they were there to kind of prompt them that, you know, it's going to be OK, but also you're not done. You're not done. This is not time to, you know, go and pick up your old profession, but rather I have work for you to do. And so that's what I think um, the two men dressed in white were trying to kind of prompt the disciples to realize. Thank you so much, Wilhelmina. So the next question is, why did Jesus reassure the disciples that he was always with them? Um, going back to the previous question, just 
So it's like, guys, I ha- I got your back, you know? Mm-hmm. I think even for us humans, sometimes we get a little, hey, get it together. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it was just, guys, once again, just know that I am here for you. I, I have the Holy Spirit with you, um, with you here. Like, I'm not gone. I'm still with you, even though I'm not here in prison. We can't see Jesus physically, right? But we still worship him. We praise him. We go to church believing that, you know, he's going to do what he says he's going to do, the plans that he has for us, he's going to accomplish them. And with his help, we're going to also do his work and share the, um, the message that he has for all of us. Mm-hmm. I feel like uh, Jesus was reaching him to let, just like, so they can never be children and they wouldn't lose hope or like begin to feed them. Mm-hmm. And then Will and Mina, uh, yeah. why did Jesus reassure the yeah. disciples that he was always with them? Okay, so I really love everything that Johanna and Winifred shared. Um, and just to really reiterate what they shared, and also what we talked about in the previous lesson, we talked about that, you know, everything in the Bible is there for a reason. Mm-hmm. If Jesus said, you know, you know, take heart, I have overcome this world, Is that means that there's going to be times when we feel so overwhelmed and we wonder, like, you know, who would, yes, God is asking me to follow his commandments, but does he know what I'm going through in this moment? Like, Jesus has verses for that to help us know that, yes, he's been through um, everything that we've been through, and yet he was without sin, right? So in this instance, when, you know, Jesus is reassuring the disciples that he is always with them, it's because he knew that a time would come where they would feel like he was not with them. And not only just physically, right? Like physically, yes, there was a time when they realized he was no longer there, but there might be a time when, you know, they're going about their day, they're preaching, they're trying to tell everyone, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. But they feel like kind of empty, you know, maybe when they were in prison, maybe when they were being stoned, maybe when they didn't even have a place to lay their head, they're like, Jesus, are are you still with me? Are you with me? And even the the same for us today, like there are times, even though like our parents have told us Jesus loves us, we come to Sabbath school and we learn Jesus loves us. There are times when we feel like, wow, I got an F on that class. Like, no, God definitely doesn't love me, right? And so I think the reason why Jesus reassures us and he has that to reassure his disciples is because he knows that there are going to be times that they doubt. There are going to be times when, you know, if you look around me, I'm not really sure that my circumstances show that Jesus is with me. And Jesus wants us to know, as he wanted his disciples to know, that even in those moments where our circumstances might not indicate it to be true, Jesus is still with us, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so he, Jesus comforted his, his disciples knowing that their world was going to be shattered, knowing that they would be confused, devastated, afraid. And Jesus just wanted them to believe and trust in him and know that even amidst all that, he was still with them. Um, and so I think that's why Jesus reassured them the same way he reassures us today. Thank you so much. And then the last question for the Cornerstone discussion is, Jesus tells the disciples to go and make na- make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How does this message apply to us? Um, that message applies to all of us, being Christians, being Seventh-day Adventists. We have this mission, that we have this goal, like the title of the whole lesson is we're agents of God, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we have to go out to the world scared. I still sometimes just like, oh, because <laughs> to be honest, I feel like at least for my age group, right? There's mm-hmm. still moments where it's like, I don't really know the Bible like that, you know? Like, mm-hmm. how am I supposed to go out there? And that's really scary for some of us. But I think it's just a reminder to all of us every day. Even the simple things, you help somebody out with their grocery or something like that. Those little, little things, that's sharing God's gospel. That's sharing God's message for us that we all love each other and God loves us. And no matter what, right, there's this um, thing in Ghana where it's like, don't don't help no stranger, like stranger danger, like, yeah. no. But I think it's also like, for us, it's scary, but at the same time, it's you need to go out there. As much as you might go through tribulations, you might go through people who might, who, I don't know, just stone you to death or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. There are all these obstacles that are in our way. And as Seventh day Adventists or as Christians, I don't, yeah, you know you're going to go through these obstacles. But at the same time, it's all the journey, right? You have to go through this journey and this pathway that God has set up for you and knowing that, okay, 
no matter what, at least I know God got my back, right? So mm -hmm. I think it's just, it just a reminder to us all that we have a mission that we have to accomplish. So yeah. And then lastly, our special guest, um, how does the message apply to all of us? Um, so I would say that the message of the Great Commission um, applies to us in that God didn't necessarily tell the disciples that when people come to you, then share me. Instead, he said, you should go. You should go and share me on your own, right? And so I think this idea of waiting for people to come to us is kind of how most of us kind of live out our faith. It's like, if someone asks us about the Sabbath, well, like, yeah, yeah, I go to church, you know, if someone asks us, okay, why are your ears pierced or why why this, why that? Then we can, oh yeah, this is my reason. But a lot of us feel shy, kind of as like Winifred was talking about, we feel shy about like going out there. And, you know, this reminds me of like, you know, going, going back to the youth camp example, like usually on Saturday, we'll go out there and we'll like go door to door. And I know a lot mm -hmm. of people tend not to go because they're taking pictures with their friends. They're kind of scared. They're like, mm, first of all, these heels. Second of all, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. I, I don't know them like that. You know, this neighborhood, I'm not sure. I'm kind of scared. I don't know what to say. But I have to say that that's often been like my favorite experiences of like camp, right? Or even like when we as a church decide to go out, every single time I'm like, ah, I'm not feeling it. I'm really like, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I heard someone made you love. Like, when I get past that and actually go out, I tend to have such a great experience. And yes, it's true, there'll be some people that won't be kind to you, but then there'll be some people who it would surprise you and mm -hmm. they would just be so kind to you and you'll get to share a message of love. Like I've had people stop me and say like, you made my day. Or like I had someone tell um, someone in our church that they were thinking of committing suicide, but because they came and they smiled, you know, and they offered something like they felt so much better, right? And so Jesus is saying that, you know, he gave us something so special, right? And like, if we think about it, there's so many children and youth today that, you know, they don't have God, right? And because of that, maybe they look to drugs. Maybe they look to, you know, like doing things with their friends that they shouldn't be doing because they don't have that love. They don't have that hope. But because we have God, we have this peace. We have this joy. We have some place to go and, you know, call home a Sabbath to keep, right? And so that's the gift that we should want to share with other people. And we shouldn't wait for people to come to us. We should, in fact, share that with others, right? You know, be willing to go out and tell other people about Christ and also be unashamed. You know, I know it's today's culture. We can't like, you know, we can't pray in church and we can't do this. And so I tell myself sometimes, you know, it's like, it's like you're kind of hiding that you're a Christian, but something that I pray to God about, like, constantly is that God give me an opportunity today to be a blessing to someone give me an opportunity today to witness to someone and I think you know something I would want us to like take away from this is that you know yes we need to pray that God will bless our food and yes we need to play, pray that you know God protects our family but we also should pray that you know God give me an opportunity to share your love and your light with other people and when we pray that prayer trust me God will take care of everything else mm -hmm. thank you so much to all three of you for your answers to the discussion so uh, before we have our special guest give us a moral lesson from the PowerPoint and the Cornerstone, we do have some comments. Um, Agnes and Tamie said, God, God be with you always. Thank you. And then Julia also gave us um, a comment. Thank you so much. So Wilhelmina, well, can you please give us a moral lesson that you got from the PowerPoint and the Cornerstone discussion? Okay, so a moral lesson that I would say I got from the PowerPoint and the Cornerstone is that one, no matter what we go through, God mm -hmm. knows and he knew about it ahead of time. So we should take heart in knowing that God sees our situation and he has a plan and a purpose for us, even though our circumstances right now might not show that. And then the second lesson, um, being change agents, something that I really got from that is that we shouldn't wait for other people to come to us. But instead, we should be always willing um, to go out there and share God's love with other people because we really do not know when we could be changing a life. And it truly is more blessed to give than to receive. And when you bless others by sharing God's love with them, you will be so blessed yourself. So just continuing to share God's love and not being afraid whatever circumstances you're going through because God knew about it beforehand and he's preparing a way out for you. Thank you so much, Wilhelmina, for the moral lesson. So to end our show, can you please close us out with a closing prayer? Sure, let us bow our heads for prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we uplift you, we glorify you, we praise your holy name. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you loved us, that you care for us. We thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. Lord, we are just children, Lord. There are so many things that we want to do that sometimes we feel like we don't have the strength to do. Lord, but we know that by your grace, by your love, by your mercy, that we are capable of doing all things, Lord. I pray for each and every one of the children and the youth, Lord, that you would help us to do your will, Lord, that you would help us to be strong in the Lord, that you would help us, even when we're feeling down and discouraged, help us to lean on you, help us to know that you knew what we were going through and you prepared a way for us, Lord. I also pray that you help us to be proud of our faith, to be proud of the fact that you died on the cross for us, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you will not let us be ashamed by the things of this world, but instead, Lord, Instead, Lord, that you will help us to be proud about the fact that you died on the cross for us and be willing to share the reason for our hope with others, Lord. I pray for strength. I pray for hope. I pray for blessings upon all the youth, Lord, and all the children. Lord, I pray that you continue to guide us in all things and help us to grow in you. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So thank you to everyone who even watched our show and even stayed to the end. May God be with you all. And I also hope to catch you guys next week. Bye.